Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Today, we are investing 30% of our Horizon 2020 program for research and innovation in order to achieve our green objectives and climate neutrality by 2050. That's about 17 billion euro so far. Tomorrow, with our new Horizon Europe program, we will invest another 35 billion euro. So there is a real political will to deliver on a climate neutral continent. We also have the means financially to deliver the research and innovation needed to achieve that political goal. Welcome to the Impact Lab. I am Julien Guerrier, Director for Policy and Programming at DG Research and Innovation of the European Commission. And today we will discuss about the climate footprint of our projects and programs and their return for society and the environment. Before we start, let me give you some guidance on how you can participate in this session. Uh, please uh, use Slido, you see the QR code on the screen to ask for questions. You should use the code um, uh, RI20, pick the Horizon Hub and ask your question or vote on the questions that are being asked. Now, let me come to the panel discussion. As I said at the beginning, uh, when I opened the session, we have the political will, we have the financial means. And we have a well-run and for the first time also a co-created framework program for research and innovation at European level. What we need to do now is to make sure that we are on track on delivering on our pledges. How can we measure the climate impact of our investment of each of our projects? How can we track whether we are delivering on these 35 billion euro investment in Horizon Europe for climate change. Uh, I invited for that two exceptionally distinguished speakers today to discuss with me, Professor Paul Ekins and Mrs. Mafalda Duarte. Welcome to both of you to the Research and Innovation Days 2020. First, to Paul Ekins. Uh, you're Professor of Resources and Environmental Policy. You're also Director at the UCL Institute for Sustainable Resources at University College London. Paul, um, Horizon Europe uh, is going to be the biggest and most ambitious EU framework program for research and innovation ever. And we are going to have the highest possible target for its um, contribution to climate action, with 35% of its budget being dedicated to climate-related research and innovation projects. So that's going, we hope, to significantly contribute to the European uh, Green Deal. How should we, in your opinion, channel those funds? And where is the contribution going to be most effective and most needed? What tools do we have at our disposal also for decision making and um, uh, for uh, impact assessments afterwards that we want to ensure uh, that they are climate um, uh, sensitive and that they um, look at the role of, um, uh, of climate in our uh, regulations. So what are the opportunities and challenges here? How can we make the best of those investments that we are going to do in research and innovation for climate in Europe? Paul, the, the, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Julien. And, um, a lot of very big questions and rather little amount of time to answer them in. But I'll do my best. I want to make points uh, very briefly along uh, seven dimensions. And as I have a maximum of eight minutes, you can see that this is going to be quite short. Uh, these ideas come from two sources, really. Um, I have the privilege of being the coordinator of one of the Horizon 2020 projects on uh, called InnoPaths, which is um, innov innovation policies and strategies for achieving decarbonization. And I was a member of the European Commission's high-level panel on the Decarbonization Pathways Initiative. I would recommend both those sources to 
uh, those who may be listening to this if they want to look into these issues in more detail. So uh, the seven points are, are one, obviously energy is absolutely crucial. And we can't overemphasize the significance of shifting away from the dominant energy characters of the industrial era, which were overwhelmingly fossil fuels, to three quite new energy carriers that have the potential to be completely clean. One is electricity, one is hydrogen, and one are uh, biofuels. And uh, uh, that requires a revolution in all energy systems. Uh, clearly, renewables will make a huge contribution, and renewables are intermittent. They will require a different kind of energy grid. They will, they will require integration across continents. And we're not talking about just um, power generation in that sense. We're talking about electricity storage at a large scale, which we've never really accomplished. Um, and the progress in battery technology and other kinds of storage technologies has been really dramatic. So there we have energy. Um, and uh, I could talk a lot more about transport, obviously, and the electric vehicle revolution that's coming. I could talk about heat pumps and their role uh, in uh, taking over from fossil fuels in heating our homes. But I want to move on to the second of my points, which is on land use and agriculture. And certainly for me, as an engineer and economist, um, that's always been a bit the Cinderella of decarbonization. But increasingly, as I look at these issues, it is looming more and more important that we need um, uh, a form of land use, a form of agriculture that actually stores carbon in the soil at a very large scale. We need, obviously, to put much more emphasis on forestry. Um, and we need uh, to start taking, through those means, very large quantities of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere um, uh, for the soil and, and uh, with, with the bioenergy carbon capture and storage. Um, the implications of that are huge, and we don't yet know uh, an enormous amount that we need to know about how to do those things. So there's an, a very large research agenda uh, for Horizon Europe. Then I, I want to go beyond, uh, beyond energy and, and talk about broader um, innovation policy, beyond R&D. Everything we've learned in, in our work on innovation over the last four years is that in order to deploy these technologies at scale, and we are talking about at very large scale, we need an innovation policy that, um, uh, of course, does research and development, but also uh, engages in large scale experiments because we don't yet know all the answers. And we're talking about system innovation for social and economic systems as well as um, technological systems, uh, and that moves into large scale deployment. We've learned a lot about this over the recent decade, um, the, the way in which we can achieve economies of scale, learning by doing uh, large scale costs reductions. And uh, when I uh, look at the cost reductions that have been achieved in a number of renewables technologies, in batteries, in fuel cells, and now coming up in electrolyzers, um, I just think that this is uh, an enormously exciting agenda. Moving on from broader R&D to think of other parts of the innovation story. Um, we will need new business models. We will need new market structures and regulation. We will need to think differently about customers and standards. And above all, perhaps, we'll need to move towards uh, the circular economy. And I, I feel really proud to be part of the, of the continent that has uh, really taken the profile of these ideas in the circular economy to uh, a, to a new level. And I think the, uh, the European Commission's um, uh, work on the circular economy over the last 10 years has been uh, absolutely outstanding, but there's still a very large, uh, very large agenda there uh, to be accomplished. Then we need innovation in financing, because obviously these very large uh, investments are going to, to uh, require the private sector to uh, put in very large sums of money, as well as public sectors, and uh, they will require the uh, normal kinds of uh, structures and, and abilities to make normal profits that uh, private uh, capital requires. We need um, to build on the innovations of the last few years of carbon prices, of feed-in tariffs, of long-term contracts, of, uh, um, the, all of all the things that have brought down the cost of capital for renewables uh, over the last few years. 
We need huge institutional innovations, insti uh, innovations in governance and regulation, markets and competition. I, I was pleased when uh, in the UK we had the Climate Change Act, which was a huge policy innovation and a huge legislative innovation, which uh, has done much, I think, to ensure that uh, the government of the UK, which has had, as you will know, rather uh, quite a lot of other things on its plate recently, uh, has uh, maintained some kind of focus um, on uh, decarbonisation. We need lots of skills innovation. Um, some of the work that we've done in InnoPaths has suggested that, uh, that we are are going to require fewer manual workers in the future and far more technicians. So we need a large-scale upskilling process. Of course, that's very good for the economy. That's very good for people because they will earn more money. But it is an enormous challenge because building new skills at that kind of scale is not easy. Uh, we need to have an enormous amount of innovation in our cities, particularly with regard to cleaner mobility, moving away from the cities of the 60s which were largely designed for motor cars, to move much more towards cities designed for people. And of course, um, the benefit of removing the large-scale use of fossil fuels for cities will be enormous on our health uh, and will give us um, a, a chance to breathe clean air in cities for the first time since the Industrial Revolution began. And my final thoughts are to do with the economy. I'm an economist, and I'm obviously particularly interested in that. And easily the most exciting thing about the whole decarbonization revolution uh, over the last 10 years has been the fact that we've now moved away from decarbonization from being an economic cost and a burden that we need to share out between countries towards uh, decarbonization being a huge industrial opportunity. Uh, I've mentioned at least half a dozen new technologies over the course of these few minutes, which can provide the basis for a new industrial revolution. Uh, clearly, they need to be um, combined with the, di the digital agenda. Clearly, they need to be combined with the circular economy agenda. And everything I know about the kind of impact assessment through macroeconomic modeling in which I've been engaged tells me that this is an agenda that can be good for growth and jobs, uh, as well as for, um, uh, for the environment, and not just for the carbon uh, environment, but for the rest of air quality. Uh, and of course, if we move to a properly sustainable agriculture uh, for the much wider environment and for biodiversity as well. And something I will um, uh, especially welcome is the fact that this new focus um, on moving towards a low carbon economy at scale uh, means that we are going to have to put uh, emphasis on the trade dimension. Uh, we cannot allow uh, low um, uh, ca 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 countries elsewhere in the world that do not grasp the carbon agenda uh, to make our new low carbon industries uneconomic. And I very much welcome the new focus in Europe on putting in place border carbon adjustments and, and very much hope that large numbers of countries will join um, a decarbonization club in order to ensure that uh, the global economy can move towards decarbonization in a secure and competitive way as well as that of Europe. So there are some few thoughts which I hope will uh, allow us to discuss these things um, in an engaged and exciting way. So thank you very much. Back to you, Julien. Well, thanks a lot, Paul, for what was a very rich and a very dense answer to indeed my many questions to, to you. You've talked about many of the things we are trying to promote in our research and innovation program, uh, the revolution of energy systems, uh, circular economy, new forms of agriculture, cities. Actually, I would like to mention two of the missions that uh, we are developing in the new framework program, Horizon Europe, the mission for smart cities and uh, the mission for healthy soils and food. Because those missions are based on research and innovation efforts, but they are actually go far beyond and they do exactly what you were proposing uh, in, your, in your answer right now, which is um, to go up to um, the funding under other instruments beyond research and innovation uh, to large scale demonstrators, uh, prototypes, um, 
experiments in order to be able not only uh, to, to, to feed in uh, the breakthrough research and innovation that we need to deliver on our objectives, but actually uh, to deploy them in practice on uh, the ground. We will need also to look at, as you said, uh, innovation in financing, uh, innovation in governing also and in governance, uh, what you call institutional um, uh, innovation perhaps, uh, investment in skills which is very much a, a priority for us and the trade dimension that was again highlighted also by President von der Leyen in, our, in, uh, in her speech on the State of the Union uh, last uh, Wednesday. Now let me come to you. Mafalda, Mafalda Duarte, you're the CEO of the Climate Investment Funds, supporting climate action in 72 developing countries. Mafalda, can you perhaps share with us your practical experience uh, when you are enabling transformative systemic change in, in those countries? How do you identify investment priorities with the climate impact at, uh, at the core? Is there also a role there for investment-informed priorities uh, or is the, the need, uh, the evidence, uh, clear enough when you are making your investment choices? Mafalda, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Julia. Um, and it's a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you. Pleasure to be with Professor Paul. I, I second everything that uh, he just said. Um, so just a little bit of uh, background, uh, these funds that I'm managing um, since, you know, these funds were established back in 2008. And as most uh, viewers will appreciate, this was the time of the financial crisis and where we weren't advancing uh, so much as it was needed in terms of the international climate negotiations. And certainly, you know, a time where we, we had not yet uh, made a lot of, or, or developing countries have not yet um, invested significantly in, in climate uh, relevant investments. Um, and, and so one, one first message from me is that, um, you know, we have through our experience of 12 years working in so many countries, as you've mentioned, 72 developing countries in very different countries and working across very different sectors, um, quite a lot on the energy sector, you know, but the land use sector as well, um, transport and others. Um, what we have come to realize is that, you know, uh, these transformation or, or um, systemic changes are possible but they do require uh, a focus and uh, an emphasis on focus, strategic focus and the process uh, itself. Um, what do I mean by this? Uh, the liberation that we want to achieve certain outcomes um, and gladly, you know, we have advanced quite a lot since then and we now have the Paris Agreement and we have, you know, commitments within the EU, which are quite ambitious. And in other countries, we have the national determined contributions. So and which are being translated in itself, you know, in terms of national uh, strategies as well. So we need that deliberate focus on achieving certain outcomes. And then we need to uh, pay attention to the process. What do I mean by by process? Um, we have focused uh you know our work in making sure that the countries are on the driving seat that they own the process and that they bring all of the relevant stakeholders uh to a to a to strategic discussions around the challenges and opportunities that the countries face in particular sectors or across sectors um and you know and we have made sure that everybody understood that we are not talking about just financing another set of good projects. We were really, you know, uh, providing the incentives and the platform for the countries and all of these stakeholders, including the multilateral development banks who are our implementing partners, um, to think how do we catalyze systemic change? What are the type of interventions at the policy level? What are the, the pilot investments that uh, need to be made to demonstrate and to demonstrate that, you know, other types of investments um, are, are viable and actually generate uh, important social economic outcomes. Um, 
And of course, you know, one of the other things that we have found to be important was uh, flexibility and predictability in in the way we uh, deployed our resources, our uh, capital to 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 the countries and to the private sector. So, talking a little bit about transformational change, uh, hopefully this will be of benefit to the audience as well. Uh, some of the things that you know we we have um, learned. Uh, over the, the course of, of our work is four areas are quite critical for transformational change and driving transformational change. One is to look at the policies and the strategies, um, what we might call enabling environment, and, and make sure that we align whatever we do with those policies and strategies if they are you know, sound and, and relevant for the climate goals or that we work with the private sector or governments in making enhancements um, in, in those frameworks and policy frameworks. Uh, the other one is systemic change, is precisely you know, a focus on we don't just want you know, investments that generate certain returns or certain results, we want to focus on changing the institutions, changing behaviors, uh, creating markets where they don't exist. Um, the third um, element of the transformational change is scale. What is the scale that would be required in a country or across you know, several countries or globally to basically you know, get to a point where there's a no return almost? Uh, to to and, and this is what we are seeing right now in renewable energy. You know, we we have supported in many developing countries first of its kind renewable energy investments, and we've made quite significant investments. You know, so I didn't mention in the beginning, but we have around you know eight point five billion dollars in, uh, in capital, and with this, you know, we are mobilizing ten times uh, this this value. Uh, in total investment, a lot of which has been, most of which has been in the energy sector and supporting the energy transition. Um, and we have seen, you know, with our support, with other financiers that 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 come alongside other partners, um, we have played quite a significant role in developing countries in making sure that certain markets are created, um, that a, a track record is established, that there are learning curves both on the government side and the private sector. So that you know, we are now we are now in this position where you know renewable energy is at parity or below parity with fossil fuel energies. That's the third dimension. So scale. The fourth dimension is is a, a dimension of sustainability. How do we need to think up front about what is required to make sure that you know we don't? It's also linked to scale. What, what I was talking about, but that you know we have set in motion. Um, processes um, that will not require, or that over time will not require, for 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 example, uh, high levels of sus subsidization. So you know, a practical example. I'll give you a practical example uh, in Zambia. The work we did in Zambia uh, across the ministries with the Ministry of of Finance at the Elm um, ended up with the efforts of many. Um, and, and there we looked quite uh, closely at the institutional frameworks, enhancements in institutional frameworks, how was climate resilience mainstreamed in uh, planning processes, in budget processes, what was the institutional capacity um, of the different ministries at the local level as well. And now what we have is a situation where you know, it is um, required of the ministries to allocate staff and budgetary resources to climate resilience programs. And that was achieved for the first time during the time we were supporting the government. Um, and also, you know, the climate resilience became for the first time embedded in their national development plans, the sixth and the seventh. And now, you know, a process of cascading that to this, the sectoral uh, strategies and also local um, action plans and local development plans. In addition to that, you know, there are other things that were identified through that process of strategic consultations, which have the potential to be quite transformative and systemic uh, and, and drive systemic change. 
Uh, so when we talk about, you know, helping countries put up new standards, for example, road standards, which we did, you know, in, in Zambia, we also did in Mozambique, that then permeates all of the public investments that are done in the country. So that that is quite important. Um, when we talk about, you know, introducing um, climate change related um, courses in master's or PhD curriculum, it means again that you know the, the potential is there to to train and have a, a, a cadre of educated professionals uh, that you know will 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 drive change uh, in the economy and in the society. Thanks a lot. So these are an example. I wanted to come back, but I can stop here, Julian, if you want. Um, I was going to come back to the point on um, the evidence, um, but yes. let me pause here and see. Yes, indeed, we, we should move on to, to that part of the um, uh, impact assessment. How do we assess the impact? How do we gather the, the evidence? Uh, uh, perhaps um, since we were talking with you, uh, Mafalda, of uh, the very concrete projects that uh, you, are, you are funding, uh, how do you collect data at project level? How do you ensure that the burden is not too heavy on beneficiaries, uh, but that at the same time you have the data that you need uh, to assess the impact of your projects on climate? Uh, how do you measure that? Um, we have, uh, and we have enhanced this over time as well. Um, we have come to an agreement on some core indicators um, like GHG emission reductions, you know, uh, install capacity, megawatts of install capacity, gigawatt hours of energy savings, how many people, um, you know, are are being um, uh, are being equipped with the skills or the the, the livelihood means uh, to withstand uh, climate impacts, how many people with energy access. Um, so those are all, um, uh, and, and there's a few more indicators. Um, we also, um, you know, do additional uh, data collection uh, efforts and evidence gathering efforts, which I think I wanted to make this point. I think it's it's actually quite critical. So just to give you a couple of examples, we have used existing economic models. Uh, and apply the economic models to our renewable energy portfolio to estimate uh, the job, you know, the, the, the contributions in terms of job creation, direct and indirect job creation, and also, you know, the, the contribution of these investments in terms of economic value added. I think this is, this is in general quite important in a COVID-19 uh, context. Uh, it, it's even uh, more important. Um, but you mentioned one point which was important, which is how do we make sure that we are not, uh, you know, that we are not overburdening developing countries, you know, many of which um, have weaker uh, systems and, and, and capacities. Um, we need to work with them. We do quite a lot of training, um, in, you know, and, and we work with them um in in making sure that we are helping them build that capacity enhancing the systems so we don't we don't start with a bar that we know it's it's not going to um possibly be met having said that you know all of the indicators that i was mentioning before this is data that we can collect where we have a little, a little bit more challenge and and are are working quite hard towards is on other indicators such as gender disaggregated indicators um, and other, you know, social inclusion or social equity type of indicators. I think there needs to be more work uh, there. But we do quite a bit of um, impact evaluation work as well. And we think I know that in the realm of in the the, the domain of evaluation and evaluators, there are many different types of uh, evaluations that that can be recommended. Some quite lengthy and more thorough, and some more simple and 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 driving more quick learning, but we find that those are quite important to actually gather that evidence of what works and doesn't work and inform, you know, future uh, interventions as well. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks um, a lot, Mafalda. Maybe I will move back to, to Paul. Um, the question from the audience is, 
what are the key indicators to measure the climate impact of, of Horizon Europe. And actually, we, we have already a number of frameworks to assess greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we are testing uh, new frameworks like the EU Sustainable Finance Taxonomy. Uh, in your view, Paul, uh, how can we use these um, systems into the decision-making process and into a, a, a fit-for-purpose measurement of the climate impact of Horizon Europe? Yeah, I mean, this is clearly, as, as, as Mafalda was making clear, I mean, this is a complicated business. And it depends on what level you're wanting to indicate impact. I mean, at the highest level, for me, the most uh, important um, indication of impact is that uh, governments everywhere um, in the uh, European Union, uh, in the UK, um, are increasing their levels of carbon ambition. So when the uh, UK government uh, decided to go for net zero by 2050, and we've seen the um, uptick in the uh, carbon decarbonization ambition of the European Union uh, for 2030, um, uh, we know that they wouldn't be doing this if they didn't believe that the technologies and the uh, methods and the financing and the companies and the skills uh, in the continent were not available in order to achieve those targets, because no uh, responsible government is going to risk making itself bankrupt, even for the climate. And so for me, that is a, a real evidence of proof that innovation over the last 10 or 15 years has brought within reach the levels of decarbonization, which 25 years ago would have been for the birds. We simply couldn't have dreamt of those sorts of um, achievements without very great costs indeed. Um, then, of course, when you come down from that level to these uh, to the next level, yes, you will want to have uh, all sorts of detailed indicators about skill levels uh, in, in decarbonizing technologies. You will want to have detailed indicators of agricultural systems and how they are being adopted um, in a more uh, environmentally friendly, nature-friendly, biodiverse-friendly and uh, low carbon and indeed carbon absorptive way. Um, you will need all those indicators across the different sectors uh, to show you how those different sectors are making progress. And again, um, there's any number of indicators you could choose. I mean, when, it, when we look at industrial processes, for example, of steel and cement, which we know are among the biggest decarbonization challenges, again, you can have a look at everything from patents for uh, low carbon processes in those industries, all the way up to investments in new plants that will produce steel and cement in low or zero carbon ways, um, uh, all the way up eventually to how many tons of zero carbon steel uh, every year is uh, are you producing? And all those are indicators of, of decarbonization uh, right across the piece. Yes. When we come back to Horizon Europe, of course, you need much more granular indicators for each of the projects that you're dealing with. And you'll be wanting their indicators of patents, and you'll be wanting to, to map the progress of those patents from their year of patenting through to the year of adoption, to licensing in other countries, to uh, the kind of um, export capacities that those patents have, have led to over time. So, Obviously, this estimation of impact is a huge amount of work, and it's it's likely to keep um, all you good folk at uh, DGR and I uh, involved uh, for for many years. But equally, um, we don't want to spend too much time on it because estimating the impact is rather less important than actually generating the impact, um, and and we need to keep a balance there between actually getting the work done so that we move in the right direction, and then being aware through our our, um, our evaluation processes that we are moving in the right direction in the speed that we would have liked so that we're making the best possible use of public money. And indeed, there are all these indicators that we have to, to look at to measure the impact on climate of our projects um, individually. But Mafalda was, was underlining as well that she's trying in, in her projects not only to have an impact on climate, uh, but more importantly, to have a systemic impact, to transform uh, society, to transform the systems and the way they are working. 
how can we measure that? How can we measure the transformational and the systemic impact of, uh, of our projects? Well, I, I mean, if we come back to electricity, for example, which in a way is, is part of the easiest one. I remember in the 1990s, uh, when I was already working on these issues, that people were saying that you couldn't integrate more than 20% of renewables into an electricity system because the intermittency would simply make the, um, make, make the grid so unstable as to be uh, unfit for an industrial society. Well, we've seen that uh, we've had a systemic change. So now we regularly integrate 40% of renewables into today's electricity system. And we're aware that there are technologies down the line of digitization, of managing electricity demand, of energy and electricity storage, uh, such that people can envisage that by 2050, we could easily have a 100% renewable electricity system, um, uh, provided we do the right things to join up the electricity systems across the continent uh, and, and to invest adequately in storage capacity. So there is systemic change. Similarly, if we look at um, the finance sector, uh, I would argue very much that the finance sector is going through systemic change. It has, over the years, put in place uh, increasingly sophisticated ways of monitoring the environmental, social and governance impacts uh, of the investments that they make. Um, it's becoming increasingly committed to a net zero agenda. It's becoming increasingly knowledgeable in, in how to assess the risks uh, of these low carbon technologies. Uh, and as we've seen uh, from Mafalda and people like others, uh, an increasing quantity of private capital is flowing in this direction, even in a country like the United States, which at the moment um, uh, at, at a federal policy level says it's going to do quite the opposite. Um, markets take it in that direction. So I, I, I think we can actually see these systemic transformations happening before our eyes probably not quickly enough, and I'm an impatient man, but nevertheless, that shouldn't blind us to what is already being achieved. Thanks a lot, Paul. Mafalda, perhaps a last word or a last recommendation to us on how we could uh, prioritize investment um, for, for climate-related projects in, in Horizon, stemming from your experience before I, I conclude and we go to the impact, uh, climate impact-related stories of our beneficiaries. Excellent. Thank you, Julian. Um, so I think, you know, one of the messages that I would like to leave with this audience, I, I don't, uh, you know, engage so much with, with this audience, and unfortunately, maybe we should engage more, is that, uh, and I've made this point in the European Commission as well, um, I think, you know, it, it is very important for Europe uh, and the European Commission to be um, exercising this leadership, global leadership, I mean, leadership in Europe, and, and also, you know, providing that leadership uh, uh, that signal uh, globally. Um, but I think it, it's very important to never forget that, you know, if we are to meet the climate goals, the Paris Agreement goals, a lot of action will need to happen outside of European Union borders in developing countries. It's in developing countries that, you know, two thirds of the trillion dollars of infrastructure investments will be made in the next few decades. And we really need to make sure that, you know, these investments don't lock us in into the future we don't want. Yes. Um, and we can't afford. And so, therefore, you know, I think from where you stand, mm -hmm. Julianne, I think one of the things that I think w is quite important is for institutions like ours to discuss how can we collaborate and bring the innovation as well into developing countries, not Thanks just, a lot. you know, the yes. European Union but into developing countries. And Thanks the areas a lot. that... All Thanks a lot, Mafalda. I have to, to cut you uh, because we are running out of time, but I think we got the message. We need to invest in developing countries. And this links back also to Paul's comment on the trade dimension and the carbon tax at, uh, at the border. Now, thanks a lot to both of you for your insights. I think uh, we've underlined, you've underlined how important it was for us to monitor the impact on climate of our projects in Horizon in order to generate the impact that we need. And now we go to the video on our climate impact uh, related stories by our beneficiaries. Thanks a lot to all of you. Thank you. The European Union aims to become climate neutral by 2050. That is, an economy 
with net zero greenhouse gas emissions. The agri-food sector involves one third of the total energy consumption in the world nowadays, and many of its processes are based on fossil fuels, which account for 22% of the greenhouse gas emissions. SIP is the acronym of Solar Heat for Industrial Processes. In this regard, SIP for Consumption is committed to show how the European agro-industry is able to make their best to decarbonize this sector and integrate solar heat into their processes. To everyone that we can integrate without disturbing the production. And the second one is that the technology is reliable, that it produces real economies, that it benefits everyone. So it's a win-win uh, solution for everyone. The sip to fair project is directly aligned with the Agenda 2030 for the Sustainable Development Goals. CIRSA Foundation is the coordinator of this four-year project, which consists of 15 partners from different key sectors, such as companies from the agro fruit sector, suppliers of solar technologies, research, development and training centers. CO2 reduction measures must be applied along all the chain, and sip to fair project is focused with the SIP processes at the production stage. Four real industrial sites were planned as large-scale demonstrators, integrating three different technologies that are installed on site with existing industrial processes and fossil heat production. The solar fraction varies between 4 and 75 percent of the total heat demand depending on the season with a CO2 equivalent reduction rate of up to 600 tons of CO2 per year. In total, solar collectors with a power of 1.7 megawatts will be installed and a saving of 2 gigawatts of energy from a renewable source will occur. And it brings, it adds uh, intelligence to the technology and therefore the technology can reach the full potential by working together efficiently. Learning for uh, technical uh, um, manager involved in the agro-food sector and um, it's about uh, training a student uh, uh, into the master program at uh, European level. The replication tool is a software able to make preliminary feasibility analysis and facilitate the design and integration of solar energy into industrial processes. As a result of the replication tool, a set of key indicators are obtained. They are from the energetic, environmental and economic point of view, ensuring that the return of investment is achieved and also reducing the greenhouse gas emissions. Did you know that Croatia has 2,600 sunny hours a year? Still, we are among the EU countries that use our solar potential the least. Energy dependency of our country is high. We import half of our annual gross energy use. We are ZEZ, Green Energy Cooperative with a focus on community-led renewable energy projects. We want to help citizens to produce and manage their own electricity. We want to help 1,000 Croatian citizens to install their own solar PV systems on their rooftops. We are building a matchmaking platform where citizens, cities and community groups will be able to connect with solar companies, installers and developers in order to gain access to information, support and affordable PV systems. We are touring in Croatia in order to gain 1,000 subscriptions to our platform. Currently, we are in Velika Gorica. That's our fourth city in a tour. In parallel, we are creating a network of partners and building a business model of community-led solarization. The business model itself will be free of subsidies and it will boost the market. We are doing it with our Slovenian partner, EZAL. The impact of our project will be seen in reduction of carbon emissions. With full-scale rollout of our project until 2030, the expected annual carbon emission reduction will be up to half a million tons. The impact will also be seen in the dedication of Croatian cities to become cities of clean, healthy and locally produced energy and their citizens becoming active energy consumers. It will impact overall increase in resilience of Croatian cities to crisis 
such as the one caused by COVID-19. Follow our efforts and show your support at our digital media channels.